the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jim Flink. For over two decades, photojournalist Carol Guzzi has covered the world, capturing breathtaking images of sorrow and joy, destruction and rebirth. The four-time Pulitzer winner has been recognized for her reporting on mudslides in Colombia, conflict in Kosovo, and the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake in Haiti. Now she's in Columbia, Missouri, where she's receiving an award from the Missouri School of Journalism. And Carol Guzzi joins me now on Global Journalist to talk about her career, what got her into photojournalism in the first place, and what sustains her in her profession. And Carol, welcome to Global Journalist. Glad to have you. Thank you. So, you know, a lot of people always like to talk about the beginnings, and your beginnings are sort of interesting because you didn't necessarily uh, start out uh, with the idea of being a, a, a photojournalist. No, I started out, um, my dream was to be an artist, but we were so poor and my mom struggled so much um, that I thought it was unwise to become the starving artist <laughs> at the time. So I decided to go to, go to nursing school at my local community college, Northampton Community College, um, because it was practical, you could always get a job, it was altruistic, and um, I got an RN and decided, well, since I have that under my belt, but it didn't feel didn't feel quite right to me. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, let me take a chance. A boyfriend gave me a camera, and um, I took a darkroom class while I was in nursing school, which I actually failed. <laughs> but um, the first time I saw a print come up in a tray, it was just the most magical thing, and I, it was my defining moment. It was when I knew that I really wanted to do photography. I wasn't quite sure what kind of photography, so I went to the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale, which offers a little bit of everything. Journalism wasn't even in my vocabulary at that time, but as soon as I took the photojournalism class, it was, it was completely clear. And, you know, from, from that beginning, and I think it's very encouraging for people who, who might be watching this show to say, um, wow, you know, I, I, can, I can follow something, I can, I can diverge from my original path. Four Pulitzer Prizes. Um, unprecedented, uh, even even now. Uh, talk talk about uh, sort of the, the the early years because I know I know you were at the Miami Herald for for eight years, um, but w leading up to that, um, what was the path? Well, while I was in school in the Art Institute, they had an internship program with the Miami Herald, and I um, it was a free program instead of taking certain classes. You'd um, you intern, and that was it. As soon as I started interning, I did back-to-back -back intern internships, and um, pretty much forgot about all the architecture classes mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And it was clearly my niche. And they they uh, had an opening when I was graduated and gave me a job. Fortunately, your first exposure to um, to Haiti, because uh, we're going to see some uh, some pictures in this uh, in this show a little bit. Um, if you're if you're watching the show as opposed to listening it uh, listening to it, um, your first exposure to Haiti, which which now is near and dear to your heart, um, talk about that. Um, well, it was while I was working at the um, I worked at the suburban um, local section called Neighbors of the Miami Herald, and my, one of my coverage areas was Little Haiti, and I felt like at that time it was the Cuban you know boat lift, and most people were paying a lot of attention to that, but. Very few people were really focusing on what was going on with Haitians, which were coming over by the thousands and forming this whole little, you know, cohesive community. And I just, I did a long project on Little Haiti, and then of course it was like I wanted to see the origins, and that was my really my first um, eye-opening experience to third world. And well, and especially under the reign of uh, Papa Duvalier yeah. then, and and how how oppressive and how uh, how difficult life was there, and that really touched you. Yeah, I think what touched me most was to see that level of poverty and, you know, the fact that they've gone through so much political conflict and turmoil and natural disasters, yet the Haitian spirit is so unbelievably rich. I mean, it's it's something I can't even describe. I've traveled a lot, and I, I have never seen anything like a Haitian smile. It's radiant, and you... You almost can't understand how anyone can possibly hold on to faith and hope and in, in those conditions, and yet these people do. And it was really kind of a humbling experience, and I would almost go down there a lot of times to get grounded, you know, in, in what was really important in life. Yeah. Uh, humbling. Um, I, I can't even begin to describe what happened there in 2010. And as, as we begin this discussion, we're going to start showing some of some of the photos that you have taken through through the years. But um, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the disaster, the scale of the disaster that struck Haiti in 2010. Well, it was obviously massive. Over 300,000 people died, and. Um, 
after spending over a decade covering covering Haiti, um, to go back and see it decimated like that, and it's just like, how can this happen to these poor people, you know? It's like one hit after another after another, and this was a huge one, and we had a lot of children following us, and mm-hmm. then a friend of mine formed a, a charity for journalists where we can donate and put them into school, and mm-hmm. Haiti became such, you know, it's like an open wound, and you can't mend it, and no matter how many pictures you take, you can't really stitch it up, so... Mm-hmm. Um, my only way to maintain sanity and keep covering Haiti was to focus on one family and say, okay, I can't make a difference for the whole country no matter how much I try to show the world what's going on here, but I can make a difference for one family. So, Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at this, this first photo. And, and they, there are some that we, that we want to warn you are, are very graphic, and, and, and this being one. Um, so a school building collapses, um, and, a, and a, a young girl dies in, in the seat in which she's... Um, seated. Uh, and this happened everywhere. Buildings were collapsing everywhere, and in a moment, lives changed. Talk about this. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, this poor girl didn't even have a chance to to run. I mean, her life was snuffed out in a moment. Her dreams, gone. Um, they were actually, the Haitians were going in themselves at that point because the rescue workers weren't there yet to try to rescue a teacher who was alive Mm -hmm. in the back, but um, there was a lot of controversy about this picture because um, some readers thought it was too graphic, but um, we have to ride a fine line, I think, of what what we show and be sensitive in news coverage, but I think there's great danger in censoring reality. I mean, the reality is 300,000 people died in in that earthquake, and you know, that was the scene everywhere for Haitians. So, I mean, I don't think you can sugarcoat something that that vast and and tragic. Talk talk about what's going through your mind as a professional photojournalist in those moments. <sighs> well, other than the heartbreak of seeing this country and the people that I love so decimated, um, you know, it it was one girl. I think you know when it's three hundred thousand people, you, know, you can't sort of wrap your head around the tragedy, but you focus on this one little girl and, you know, it just rips your heart out. Right. Um, we, have, we have more photos uh, from Haiti, and, and I think what we'll do is we'll now just sort of um, go through a few of them. Uh, this, is, this is probably very shortly after the aftermath, and, and you, you were in, uh, in, in Washington, I presume, um, at the time that, the, that this happened, and they immediately deployed you and another photographer to go there, and is this is this one of the first scenes you came on? Uh, no, that was actually um, I don't can't keep track of the days, sure, but sure. it wasn't the one of the first days. But it was in the in the beginning when they were burning bodies, you know, mm-hmm. and um, burning a lot of the debris, and you know, this scene to me sort of is hopeful in a way. I mean, amid all this destruction, I mean, that's the Haitian spirit to me. I mean, there's this little couple still holding hands, still, you know, grasping onto life, I guess. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and describe for our radio audience uh, what's going on here. We have uh, several um, sort of small blazes that are, that are occurring off to the right of the picture, and then to the left you have this couple hand in hand. Um, w- what else is going on behind the scenes? Well, there was a lot of looting in that area um, that was going on. Uh, and I shouldn't even call it looting because they were buildings that were, you know, basically trashed and Haitians were desperate for anything, for food, for water, for, you know, whatever they could find. So, um, This scene was mass chaos. I mean, this was in, in, in the respect that we would think of right. it. Because... Um, as a journalist at the time, I was I was covering folks who were afraid to go to to, to go there, and and uh, because the UN had pulled back, and yet you're out in it. How how do you do that? I mean, when when soldiers themselves won't go out, when aid workers won't go out, and yet you're out in that. The risk for me, you know, depends on the you know the importance of the story. I'm I'm not courageous. I mean, I think there's a lot of incredible journalists out there with amazing bravery and courage and tenacity that are... I, I don't take chances like other people do, mm-hmm. and because of that I probably don't, you know, make the same pictures. Um, but just being there is a risk, so uh, you have to just risk for what matters, and if it matters. 
did you have a safe haven at that point or were you living as the Haitians were living in whatever situation presented itself? Um, we were staying at a uh, at a hotel, a, the Olufsen Hotel, where, where it was a journalist hotel. It was one of the few that wasn't um, collapsed. Uh, I slept outside <laughs> because I was afraid that would fall. It was a wooden building and there were a lot of aftershocks which were freaky, but in the middle of the night it was amazing because you're laying there under the stars and people were singing hymns all over the city. They would get together and sing in Creole these beautiful hymns and you're, I mean, it really got to your heart that, you know, in the middle of this whole disaster they're out all night long singing hymns, so. We're going to go back to that school for just a moment and, um, and describe this young lady and uh, what, what she has just discovered. Yeah, the, um, we were there when she arrived and um, she just threw herself on the ground flailing and screaming, my brother's in there, my brother's in there, I can see him but I can't pull him out. And um, She could actually see his shoes. See his shoes, that's what the translator told us. And uh, she was just crying her eyes out. And it kind of says it all, I mean, the, you know, the loss, the the horror, you know, the devastation, and, and you know, how deeply, how deeply hurt, you know, this, this caused, the hurt caused to this country and to each individual that, you know, lost someone. Yeah. Um, to that issue, you have said sometimes uh, before that, that, that the camera is sort of your shield, that, that the, I, I don't know if it's the act of, of doing this or, or what. Uh, explain that. Um, I think like any, anyone who covers disaster, disasters, rescue workers or you know, firefighters or anyone who, or doctors even, anyone who has to do a job um, has to find some, some veil, I think my veil my shield, whatever you want to call it, is the camera, because I have to do the job. I mean, I cry a lot, <laughs> even when I'm shooting pictures, because I think we're all subjective beings, and objectivity, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to be objective when you witness a lot of the things I've seen, so, um, but it's after you take the camera down, it becomes real, you know, when you start editing the pictures, and you start really seeing and feeling, um, and there's an aftershock, in itself, you know. Um. So, um, uh, continuing on the theme, and 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 so much of your career um, has has been built on on covering disaster. We're going to move to the 9/11 uh, tragedy, and and there is one picture in in particular. Um, this young man um, who is uh, obviously holding uh, a fire helmet. Explain what's going on. Well, I went initially um, to cover you know, the terrorist attack, but eventually I had um, wanted to follow the firefighters through their grief. I mean, this was the largest disaster they have ever had, 343, you know, first responders were killed, and um, I ended up taking a leave of absence because they, the magazine decided they didn't want to, they didn't want to follow it, so as I was doing my Sierra Leone amputee story, I, I also did, followed all the endless memorial services, um, and it just, it never stopped. I mean, there were bagpipes playing in New York for a year afterwards, and people were, you know, didn't even have bodies. They were just bearing, you know, helmets or whatever, and this young man was standing on the corner as, you know, the procession went by and just... And it was his brother breaking, who, had, who break, had died. Breaking down, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you uh, you talked about um, uh, taking a leave of absence for for work. Um, it is difficult sometimes for organizations, whether it be the Washington Post or or the Miami Herald or whomever, to stay on top of a story like that. It it is one of the unfortunate things about journalism, and especially with someone like you, right. that um, new things happen. And staying with a story like yeah. you did, it's hard. Yeah, I, there's a lot of things I don't do well, but the one thing I have is staying power and tenacity, and I really love to um, be able to go beyond the surface and have depth and intimacy in a story, and the only way you're going to get that is to spend time. And unfortunately, you know, especially today, papers and, you know, organizations don't have the resources, you know, to allow someone that kind of time that, you know, even then, you know, I would start a story for the post and then I'd take a leave of absence to finish it because I just would know when it, when it wasn't 
when it wasn't complete. And, um, you know, it meant more to me than a paycheck to, um, to tell the story properly. And, to, you know, I feel like we have a responsibility to people when they open their lives to us and our cameras. I think we, um, we owe them the best we can do. So. How do you know when you have a good, sh a good photo? I mean, how do you know when you are documenting something? Because I know you're not thinking about it in terms of pixels or framing necessarily. That probably has become second nature by now. How do you know that as we look at this next picture? Um, oh, well, that was a moment. That was a wow moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there's certain moments. I mean, I'm a moments photographer. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of my pictures are not technically perfect, and mm -hmm. I don't even care. It's the moment that matters. And um, every now and then, you realize you just hope it's sharp. <laughs> right. But it, something like this was so profound in its, you know, um, symbolism. For our radio audience, the Statue of Liberty is in the backdrop. In the foreground, we have a young child, an amputee, um, and, and her, her left arm is raised in the foreground as Lady Liberty's is in the right, uh, in the background, her, her right arm obviously is raised. And there's, is there some sort of symbolic, you, you were mentioning that, what, what, what are you seeing here? Well, the, the, this group of um, Sierra Leone amputees came during the war to get prosthetics for, through a program. A uh, doctor was donating prosthetic limbs, and this was a fundraiser ferry ride they were taking. Um, and this just, again, to me, it, it sort of, it symbolizes America's willingness, for one thing, to open their hearts um, and pocketbooks a lot of times to others in need and, um, you know, and her basic, you know, victory mm -hmm. over such horror and tragedy she endured as a little four-year-old, uh, Memuna her name is, and she's, uh, I did the four-year saga on these kids and they eventually got political asylum, were adopted all over the U.S. and, um, their family lived in D.C. that adopted Memuna, and they said the only reason they found her was through my pictures, and they made me godmother, which was one of the biggest honors of my life. So. Yeah, and there's there's so much about uh, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, you only exactly. to be free. So. Exactly. <laughs> now, as we continue the discussion, I want to remind everyone that you can view or listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcast at globaljournalist.org. You can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to this program on our website. So be sure to send questions, comments to globaljournalist at kbia.org or send them to our Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at Global Journ. You talk about a shield, but no shield can prevent the heart, um, especially when you're seeing people uh, murdered before your eyes who die in tragic circumstances. And, and we were talking a little before the show about the need for counseling, and at one point you, you did need that. No, I, I'm still in counseling right now. Um, yeah, I think it's vitally important that we start addressing the post-traumatic stress that occurs with journalists. I mean, even on local stories, you get very close to people and, you know, Sometimes you witness their death or their tragedy, and it's, it, we're subjective beings, and it's going to affect, it's going to take a toll. It's going to take an emotional toll, and, and my mistake a long time ago was that I was jumping from story to story to story and repressing a lot of that emotion, and I just had a complete meltdown and had to go into counseling and try to find coping mechanisms. Um, and right now I'm just going through a lot of losses. My mother just died, so I'm in bereavement counseling because I, I firmly now believe that we need, we need to ask for help. You mm -hmm. know, we can't do it ourselves. And, and most journalists want to be tough and, you know, sometimes pretend they're cynical. And, but honestly, if you're a compassionate person, you know, I've, I unfortunately have a great deal of empathy. And I, I think that may be the reason my pictures resonate with people because of this unbelievable amount of empathy I have, but that empathy also makes my heart break 10,000 times worse. So um, counseling is invaluable, and especially young journalists need to be aware that, you know, we jump in and out of people's lives all the time, and what we see is, is going to change us in some way, you know, for the good or the bad. And A lot of times uh, people will say uh, that there, there is this choice uh, when journalists, uh, that they have an opportunity to jump in the fray and help, be a person as opposed to be a professional and document. And, and there, was a, there was a situation in Colombia um, many years ago where um, 
you didn't have that opportunity, though the picture itself might not have um, lent itself to that discussion had you not read the caption. And can you talk a little bit about, um, about that photo as, as, as we pull it up um, of the young girl who was captured, caught, uh, after, uh, I think it was a mudslide, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and here it is. It's a mudslide in Colombia. Um, well, She's up to her neck in water. Right. And people are trying to comfort her, but they can't get her out. Yeah, they, um, well, first and foremost, I think you're human and a photographer second. So if you can help and save someone's life, you do. I mean, we've pulled a lot of people in Haiti out of mobs that would have been ripped apart, you know, and, you know, you, but in a situation like this, there were already rescue workers there. Um, everyone was at the scene trying to help at the area where I was at. So my role was to document and, and show the world how, you know, big this tragedy was. And this young lady's name is Omira Sanchez. Omira Sanchez. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, I, I shot these pictures and she was, you know, speaking in Spanish, but, you know, speaking out to her mother. Um, and she was trapped in this water for, was it three days? No, it was, well, it was, it was a long time. 59 hours, I think, okay. was what they had said. For some, I, I shot these pictures and then I had to leave to hike all the way back out to get the film. Those were in the, the days where you <laughs> shot transparencies and you got, went back out, put the film on a plane. And, you know, um, by the next day when I finally got back in, I thought I was missing a great rescue picture. I mean, mm. I thought there was no reason they weren't going to rescue this little girl. And I heard she had died and I could not believe it. Somehow she was trapped in a way that they couldn't get her out and she perished. And... Um, I did a follow-up story about six months later. I went back to, to Columbia, and I found her mother and um, asked her what she thought of all this coverage of her little girl, you know, because she was right at the forefront, and everybody took her picture, you know, as, as she was basically dying and calling out for her mother. And she had made this little memorial with all the clippings and all the newspaper articles about her, and she said she was so honored that... Um, that her little girl could be the face of this tragedy. And I couldn't believe it, you know. I mean, I thought she'd be angry. Instead, mm -hmm. she was honored. You know? Well, and she has since become the subject of, uh, of folk songs and of other uh, sort of commemorative acts, whether they be uh, poetry or whatever it might be. So she, she became the face of, um, of, of, of Columbia uh, uh, being more reactive to, to these kinds of disasters, to have a more proactive, rather, stance, yes? Yes, I, I would hope so. Um, I think there were, if they had certain tools, they probably would have been able to get her out, but um, she, she became the symbol, the memorial. Basically, she was the memorial for all those people. 25,000 people, I think, died in that mudslide. The, the still photo, um, perhaps um, in some respects, and I don't know if you would agree with this, but um, can be underappreciated. Um, and yet, uh, it, is, it is always the thing on the front page of, of the newspaper, whether it be traditional or, or, or electronic now. Um, do, do still, does still photography still get its due? And I mean, we, we have seen so many examples of the power of how it can change lives. It can, it can spawn Red Cross recovery efforts. It can do so many things. Does it get its due? Um, well, now, with, you know, video and, you know, actually the addition of audio, to me, there's no power like the still photograph. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's my personal opinion, but it's, it's capturing a moment in time that, you know, that moment um, that will never be again. I mean, if you blink, you look left instead of right, you miss it. But to, to, memor to capture that and save it for eternity, I mean, for some reason, I think it stays in people's minds more than the moving image, more than video. And, and it, it's just, I find it to be so powerful. And to add audio to that, like we do audio, online audio galleries now, still photos with audio. And that's another dimension that I think only enhances the still photograph and, and gives it even more depth. You have said you're not a big fan of, of, of being on the interview shows and you're kind of shy and yet, uh, you know, you are being honored by the Missouri School of Journalism, the four Pulitzers. Um, you, you accept that, I know, as part of it. I know it's not your motivating factor, but um, talk a little bit about being honored for your work and I know that you, you are honored with a lot of your colleagues. What does that mean to you? Well, it means a great deal. I mean, just to be um, honored by your peers is is um, certainly personally gratifying, but I think more importantly, it, it brings light 
back to the story. I mean, it, it almost gives a second life to a story that, you, that you've done in the past, and all of a sudden you get awards and it, it comes back to life and it makes you remember, oh, yeah, they still have a lot of need in Haiti, and oh, um, by the way, you know, this is still going on because I think media outlets have a short attention span, you know, and we, we hit the news mm -hmm. and then we move on and their people are stuck long after the headlines are gone in the reality that they have to live in. And I think the awards do a great deal to, to make that reality resurface for them. And you mentioned that um, the, the passing of your mother and the fact that you're going through counseling and you have, you have chosen to dedicate this award to your mom. Talk about what she means to you and, 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 and why. I've, I've had an awful lot of losses in the past um, few years and even recently. A friend died, two friends died just before my mother did and um, she had Alzheimer's, battled Alzheimer's for 10 years and my sister now is disintegrating with Alzheimer's. So um, she was just, she had a really hard life and she, she was strong enough to bring us up with the right values and I think she instilled a lot of compassion and empathy and certainly tenacity in me. And um, I just owe her so much. Um, I don't think I'd be who I am today, of course, without her. And so I just, I just felt like the only way I could get through this since she had just, she's just passed away um, was to dedicate it to her memory. Sorry. No, do you think there's something she'd tell you if she were sitting right yeah. here besides besides don't cry for me? <laughs> <laughs> no, she'd, she'd be really proud. Mm -hmm. She'd be proud. And, and did, she, did she have any thoughts about your four Pulitzers? Did, did she want them on her mantle? Well, she, at that point, when I got the fourth Pulitzer, I mean, she had gone with me to, you know, the earlier ones. By the fourth Pulitzer, she was um, pretty late stage Alzheimer's. And... The first thing I did when they made the announcement was I called the nursing home and I said, because she was also deaf, but I could get her to talk and mm -hmm. pull her out of that world. It's like they have a foot in two worlds. Mm -hmm. So I told the nurses, I said, please, can you yell in my mom's ear, ear and say, you know, Carol just won a fourth Pulitzer. They promised me they'd do it. I don't know if they ever did. Mm -hmm. But um, when I ended up going up there on Mother's Day, she was having one of her really good days, a lucid day, and I told her myself, I said, guess what, you know? Oh my God, I got a fourth Pulitzer, can you believe it? And she looked straight at me and she said, get out! <laughs> and I, and I, I really think it registered and it, was, it meant the world to me that I was able to actually tell her. I think it drives home the point that, um, you know, what we see through the lens or as the result of the lens, you know, I, I know that you, you are open to criticism. How can you do that? How do you do that? And I think seeing seeing the heart that goes into this and the change that is affected um, answers that question without you having to utter a word. So thanks so much for being with us. I, I think the other problem is that people look at us as evil vultures and think the photos are, are the problem. It's not, the photos aren't the problem. We are documenting the problem and that's where they have to make the difference, differentiate. <laughs> Thank anyway, you. thank you. <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank Global you. Journalist is produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the University of Missouri School of Journalism. I was joined today by Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist Carol Guzzi. Global Journalist is directed by Travis McMillan. Uh, audio is by Pat Akers. Randy Tungakar is our executive producer. And please join us again next time for another Global Journalist. I'm Jim Thayer.